Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, everyone. And as the head teacher of Cranley Hill Primary School, I'm very happy to welcome you to our open day. Today the school is open not just to parents of our pupils, but also to anyone else interested in seeing the school. I'll start by telling you about the school, and after that you can walk round and see it for yourselves. We take most of our pupils from the two nearby villages of Seabourn and Millthorpe. These were once coal mining villages. There have been coal mines here since the 1830s. When the school was originally established, way back in 1899, almost every child's father worked in the mines. However, the coal mines were closed in 1983, and many people left the area as a result. Nowadays, most of the remaining inhabitants tend to commute to work in the city rather than working locally. At present, the number of students on our rolls is just 90, compared to almost 200 in 1985, due to the decline in the population of the mining villages. And the staff see this as a big bonus, because we know each student personally. The school is very involved in the local community, and we are especially proud of our status as Great Britain's first school to be entirely powered by wind energy. This project began several years ago when it was decided that a wind power turbine should be installed in the school field. This now supplies the school with all the electricity we need, and there is also power left over for the villages nearby, the opposite situation to that in the past when it was the villages which supplied the school with power in the form of coal from the mines. The project has been of enormous benefit to the school in other ways as well. It has allowed exciting learning opportunities about electricity generation and the turbine has also inspired poetry, art and even our own song. It also allows teachers to introduce global issues such as carbon dioxide emissions and global warming to the students. I feel it may be irresponsible to burden young children with worries about global issues which are insoluble, but by actually using wind power as a non-polluting, renewable source of energy, instead of using fossil fuels such as oil or gas, we are offering practical solutions to our pupils in their own environment. The school is also extremely involved in other environmental issues. In the last few years, we have developed our school field into what we now call our secret garden, which you will have a chance to explore shortly. Here, the pupils have their own organic vegetable patch, and another special feature of the school is that the vegetables grown here are used in the school kitchens for school lunches, with any extra ones being taken home by the children to share with the community. You are going to hear some announcements. As you listen, answer the questions below. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention for a moment, please. I have the final notices for this final session of the conference. Now, first of all, I'd like to mention that the cross-cultural session has been very popular. So we're moving the final discussion to room 203. That's room 203, which means that the grammar session will be changed from room 203 to room 302. That's the grammar session in room 302. I hope everybody's got that. Now I have a notice here that you must return your keys to the reception desk before you leave. Thank you. Turning now to your discussion records, I would like to see you return them to the session chair people by 4 o'clock this afternoon. That's 1600 hours. Thank you. Regarding coaches for the airport, um, they will be gathering outside the main building at 3.30. That's uh, 15.30 hours. And there will be another one a little later than that at 16 hours. That's 17.50. And 5.15.
I'd like to ask you all to be there, ready for the buses, at least five minutes before the departure times, so we can all leave promptly and everybody will get home on time. Thank you. I have particular messages for、um, Professor Hurst and Professor Cole and Professor Malnachurk. I'd like to ask you three: Are you here, Professor Hurst, Professor Cole? Yes, and Professor Malnachurk. I'd like to ask you to collect your reprints from the conference desk before you leave. Thank you. Finally, I have a reminder from Professor Olson of Leeds University. That the sixth annual convention of EFL will be held in Bangkok, October, um, 2006. I think you'll all be、uh, interested in marking that date on your calendar. That's the sixth annual convention of EFL, October 2006. And I'd like anybody that's interested in that conference to leave your name at the conference desk. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it has been a very happy event for me this conference, and I hope that you too have found it a happy and productive time. Thank you all for coming. Now listen and answer questions one to three. Josie, come in. How are you? I'm good. Can I get you a coffee or anything? No, that's okay. I can't stay long, but you said you wanted to talk to me about that course I'm doing this semester, Music 103. That's right. Actually, I was a bit confused because I thought you were majoring in maths. That's right. I am. I'm doing four maths modules this year, but it's an optional course. You just choose it if you're interested, and you can do it whatever department you're in. Why? Are you thinking about doing it? Well, I'm not sure. What are the requirements? What? The course requirements. I mean, what do I need to know about music to be accepted on it? I do listen to a lot of music, everything from hip hop and rap to classical, and I can sing, sort of. Well, for a start, one special thing about this course is that it's distance learning. You don't actually have to be at the university to do it, and you don't have lectures. So you've got to be able to work on your own without someone telling you what to do all the time. Oh, oh, no, that should be okay, I reckon. I'm more worried about the actual musical stuff. Like, I don't know how to read music. That doesn't matter. They don't assume that. You'll learn as you go along. How's your maths? Not too bad. Right. Some of it's quite mathematical, so you really need to be strong there. But you play the violin, don't you? I don't play anything. You don't need to. What about computer skills? You're okay there. Yes, reasonably. Does that matter? Yes, I'd say they're essential. Like I said, it's all distance learning, so it's computer based. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. In the exam, you would have twenty-five seconds to look at the questions. Pause the recording for twenty-five seconds now. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. But what about lectures? You don't attend any. It's all online. So lots of the students aren't here in Canada at all. They're studying from home all over the world. We've got someone from my group in Jamaica, and a couple from Taiwan. Oh, and some from Hong Kong as well. So, how does it work? Oh, well, there's a multimedia course website on the internet where you can listen. You can listen and watch at the same time, and of course, you can do it at your own pace. So, if you don't understand something, you just go back. Or if you want some more examples of the music, there are links there to things that you can listen to. There's quite a lot of theory, but it's all done through musical examples, so it's practical at the same time. Like in the last module I did, we looked at a bit of the music from the movie Star Wars, the Darth Vader theme, you know. Dum 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 dum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Then we looked at a theme from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Do you know it? Written in the 1850s, and we could see there were all sorts of parallels between them. 
And that's a feature of the course. We often look at modern Hollywood themes to illustrate concepts in classical music. Hmm, that sounds really interesting. Do you have a course book? No, we don't use one. We're given a software program called Notability Light, and what it does is it presents what we write, the music we write, really clearly. And it also allows us to play back any piece of music on our computer at home. But that's not all. We can write our own music, quite complex stuff for various instruments, and the program plays it back to us. Plays the actual music? Yes. So it means that your computer is actually your own musical instrument. And we can even submit our finished pieces to our tutor by email. So you do need your own computer, obviously. Yes, with at least sixty-four megabytes of RAM. That's okay. I've got a hundred and twenty-eight. Hmm. Oh, and a CD-ROM and a sound card, of course. No problem. So, how long is the course? It's six months. There are two a year, so you could actually enroll for the next one if you wanted. It starts in January. I started last September, and I finish in February. And how many credits is it? Three. In order to pass, you've got to do six assignments. I'm just doing my fourth one now, and take a final examination. Oh, anyway, why don't you call round sometime, and I'll show you the sort of things we do. You can even listen to some of my music. That would be great. Well, thanks, Josie. Now, are you sure you don't have time for that coffee? You will hear a job interview. As you listen, answer questions one to ten. Please sit down, Mr. Wilson. My name's Jane Smith, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello. How do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to talk about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Evening News? It is Evening News, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. I left university in two thousand and two. Is that right? Yes, at two thousand and two. Then I was unemployed for about two months, and then I travelled round Britain for a few weeks. So it must be more than three years now. In fact, um, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change your job? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting. The salary is okay, so it's nothing to do with money. Though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted. So that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. My colleagues are quite nice to go along with, so there's a good cooperative atmosphere. And compared to other presses, the working conditions are great. I mean, the office itself is good. Um, yes. And then there's the fact that as a journalist, I regularly write articles. About what is happening at home or in the world, so I have to make decisions. I must be responsible for what I have written. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. They give me lots of room for initiative. Yes. Well, we're looking for someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. I often work irregular hours. I was very often made to work at night. Some sort of job that would come up that was very important, and they said it had to be finished.、Uh, it's got to go into the newspaper the next day. There was a lot more pressure in writing an article for the newspaper. And what about your education? You went to Leeds University, didn't you? Yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design at the university. But I decided to change courses and did a postgraduate diploma in social and public policy instead. Good. Have you done any courses since? You are going to hear a talk about Bell College. As you listen, answer questions one to ten. First, look at questions one to ten. Now listen to the talk. Welcome to Bell College. 
The aims of the college is to foster the growth of international understanding through the provision of a high standard educational course. Second, the college is based in a residential setting for adult students from abroad. And last is to make a positive contribution to the development of teaching English as a foreign language. Bell College is one of a group of schools run by the Bell Educational Trust, a non-profit making educational foundation. The college offers an attractive environment for study and leisure for students aged 18 or over. 160 students live in comfortable single and twin study bedrooms on the campus and a further 70 or 80 with carefully selected local families. The excellent common room facilities in the college are matched by the extensive gardens and sports fields. Superb academic facilities including a modern learning centre and library and sophisticated computer networks are available for students use in class hours and in the evenings and at weekends. A wide range of courses is offered in three areas. The main English programme, teacher training and English for specific purposes. The teaching staff are highly qualified native speakers with wide experience of working in schools, colleges and universities in many parts of the world. Living in an international community of 30 or more nationalities is an important part of the Bell College experience. Great stress is laid on pastoral care and the college has its own medical centre. A busy and interesting programme of sporting, cultural and social activities is provided in the evenings and at weekends with excursions to many parts of Britain. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. In the last lectures, we looked at the art of the ancient Egyptians and then considered the art of other ancient Mediterranean civilizations, in particular Greece and Rome. We're now going to return to Egypt to consider a set of very unusual pictures known as the Fayum portraits. The Fayum is a lush green area about 100 kilometers west of Cairo. Following the conquest of Egypt by the Greek warrior Alexander the Great in 332 BC, large numbers of businessmen and officials who had come over from Greece settled in this fertile region with their families. They gradually adopted some features of Egyptian culture, including the practice of mummification, embalming the bodies of their dead and wrapping them in linen bandages in order to preserve them as mummies. The name actually comes from an Arabic word meaning an embalmed body. These newcomers made one distinctive innovation, though. After binding the mummy, they laid over the face a picture representing the person inside. The portraits look like oil on canvas, but they were actually produced using a technique called encaustic, where the artist applies pigmented wax to a wooden board with a small spatula. The Egyptologist William Petrie, who discovered many of these mummies with their accompanying portraits at the end of the 19th century, was convinced that they were actually done in the lifetime of the subject, rather than being painted after the person's death, as had been the case with older Egyptian paintings. He felt they were very different from the traditional stylized images that had been used on Egyptian mummy casings in previous centuries, and was convinced that they were actually portraits giving a realistic depiction of the person. He pointed out that the boards on which they were painted showed signs of having been cut down to size to fit within the mummy bandages. To him, this suggested that they may have originally been larger and been hung in the houses of the owners during their lifetimes. But more than a century after they came to light, nobody knew how far they were really depictions of real people, as against idealised portraits. Then a team from Manchester University decided to find out,
by recreating the faces of Fayum mummies in clay and then comparing the reconstructions with the portraits. The team was provided with skulls from two Fayum mummies from the British Museum and given the information, based on x-rays and other evidence, that one of the mummies was of a fifty-year-old man and the other was a woman in her early twenties. Armed only with this information, they set to work. First, they created copies of the skulls. Then they used clay to build up the facial muscles in order to reconstruct what the person looked like. After weeks of painstaking labour, two faces emerged. Only then were the two portraits revealed so that the match between the reconstructions and the portraits could be examined. In the case of the man, both model and portrait showed a broad, flat face with a slightly hooked nose and a fleshy mouth with broad lips. But the man in the portrait was noticeable for his five o'clock shadow, the beard beginning to grow around his chin and on his cheeks. This would have been quite a recognisable feature of the man in real life, and an easy thing for the painter to copy. However, it wasn't something that the makers of the model could know about. In the reconstruction, the right eye was slightly higher than the left, and this was the same on the portrait. But on the portrait, the eyes were very large, which is standard with many of the Fayum portraits, while in the model they were longer and narrower. The portrait of the woman appeared to be even more of a standard type, with her large eyes, straight nose and small mouth. These pretty feminine features suggested this could be an idealised woman's face, and yet it proved to match the reconstruction surprisingly closely. The proportions of the lower face corresponded, and so did those of the forehead, though in the portrait the eyes were closer together and larger than in the reconstruction. And in both cases the head was set on a solid neck, suggesting a more powerful physique than you might have expected from these delicate features. So, overall, the similarities between the portraits and the models are too close to be accidental. The artists may have started from a standard picture, but attempts were made to modify this to reflect the characteristics of the subject, what gave the face its personal qualities. Obviously, this isn't much of a sample upon which to judge an entire genre of portraiture, but the researchers are convinced that, on the whole, the artists aimed to represent their subjects as they appeared in real life, whether this was flattering to them or not. You are going to listen to a talk about au pairs in the UK. Look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 1 to 10. What is an au pair? An au pair is a single girl without any dependents who comes to the UK to learn English and to live as part of an English-speaking family. She is not a domestic servant but may help in the house for up to five hours a day for pocket money. Suitable tasks would be light housework and taking care of children. She should have one day each week completely free and she should be free to attend language classes and religious services if she wishes. Pocket money should be between 15 and 20 pounds per week and she should have her own room. Before she arrives, she should have as much information as possible about the home she is going to and what she will be expected to do. She will find it helpful to have a letter from her hostess explaining the arrangements to show the immigration officer when she arrives. An au pair must be a single girl aged at least 17 and no older than 27 when she first becomes an au pair. She must be a national of a Western European country which includes Malta, Cyprus and Turkey. The longest a girl may stay in the UK as an au pair is two years. A girl who has been in the UK before as an au pair will be allowed to come to the UK again as an au pair only if the total period is not more than two years. An au pair is not allowed to take a job in this country. The light household duties which are part of the au pair arrangement are not regarded as employment. An au pair who is a national of a country which is not in the Commonwealth or European community 
EC and who is admitted for longer than six months will normally have to register with the police. This will be shown in her passport. She must take her passport and two passport size photographs to a police station. She will have to pay a fee, about £25. If an au pair wishes to stay longer than the time stamped in her passport, she may apply either by post to Luna House, Croydon, or in person at one of the public inquiry offices. If she applies by post, it is a good idea to send any valuable documents by recorded delivery post. She should apply before the time limit on her permitted stay runs out. She must show that the arrangements are still those of an au pair. She may change host families during her time in the UK, providing that the new arrangements are also those of an au pair.